Um, so that's something that maybe one day we can expand our horizons because I'll tell you what, as English Christians, we just think about ourselves. You know, especially the American Christian, it's all about you. You know, you don't think of, well, the Bible's translated into Chinese, the Bible's translated into Indonesian or Russian. Um, there's translations all around the world, and all those cultures have a different story. Um, but this one will be more of the English side of things um, that we're going to look at today. And as for a quick review here, um, you know, I know it's probably harder to see, um, but this was from the last sermon. The idea that it took time for the Old Testament that was inspired, the original works, to be fully finalized. So the, the Bible, the starting of the Old Testament, that was around 12,000 before Christ, B.C. And there was always little updates. They would say that something happened in Dan, even though this was during the time of Abraham, and little updates were made by scribes, and that was fine. The inspiration still guided the building of the Bible. Another example I used last time was the Psalms, because you have certain Psalms, they say, this is the end of the Psalms, this is the end of the book of David, and they still have another 30, 40 Psalms left that they eventually added into the back of the book. That doesn't mean that those new Psalms were uninspired, it just took time to find them all, and then eventually here at the end, you have the uh, autographia, that's where the Bible didn't change anymore. And the scribes kept it as it was, and that was sometime around 200 um, B.C., when it was fully canonized by the Jewish people, and that was the Old Testament. So here's the idea of you have inspired textual updating, where they would make update the place names of certain things, and then from the point of around 400 B.C., it was all just transmission. So, I mean, we don't, ha we don't go today, and in our New English Version Bible, we don't say Tel Aviv when we say something about Israel. We don't continue to update things. From that point forward, it's been pretty much the same. And we also, just to review, Jesus himself in Luke 24, 44 through 45, he talks about the law of Moses right here. He talks about the prophets and the Psalms. And those are the three pillars of the Tanakh, remember? The Psalms were the, wis the wisdom literature. And so Christ himself in Luke 24 44 through 45, he reconfirmed the canon of the old Hebrew Bible. Um, additionally, there were three texts, three Old Testament texts during Christ's life. During his time, you had the Greek Old Testament. We called it the Septuagint. You had a Sumerian Torah. And then you also had the Hebrew Old Testament, which mainly was nearly destroyed when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. But you had a tradition carrying on um, by the Masoretes, and that's the, the, that is primarily what's in our Bibles today, the Old Testament, is the Masoretic text. But many of the new translations today, they may have some more Septuagint renderings from the Greek side, or they may have more Masoretic ren renderings, um, but those are the main things that are supplying our Old Testament today. And then, of course, very important for all of us and all Christians, in AD 1947, so World War II, you think of 44, and 1947, you had the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you look up here, you had all these codices we had from the Old Testament, the Leningradensis, which is in Leningrad. You had the Aleppo Codex. You had the uh, Samaritan Hebrew. You had the Septuagint. And the question was, all of this accurate? What is all of this accurate? Well, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, those texts were old, older than everything we had. These were the only two complete Old Testaments we had. And they actually reaffirmed that our tradition, the Old Testament that we have in our Bibles today, is actually very accurate. So I would imagine many Christians, every time a new archaeological find happens, they kind of wonder, you know, is, is this going to shake my faith? But the Dead Sea Scrolls only confirm the faith. And it's been, you know, found in 47, it took them many, many decades to go through those and translate them. Many of them were, and I was reading, small little pieces. And they have to put all these scrolls together because they're so degraded. Small little pieces, and then they, then they try to read what the scrolls said. 
So today we'll go over how um, we got the New Testament. Um, and you know, there was this, this idea, if you open your Bibles to Ezekiel uh, 8 through 11, there's this idea that there was a time when this, the word of the Lord or the Holy Spirit spoke to the prophets of old. But then you go to Ezekiel 8 and something happens. And if you just quickly skim through Ezekiel 8 through 11, there is something that's happening. Um, there's a few pictures in here. Here there's the mark. Remember, there's a scribe that goes marking, and they start first at the house of Israel, and they're marking a man with an ink. So that's a lot of thing that, that ties us to the, you could say, the mark of the beast or the sealing. But in there, aside from all of that story, there's something happening with the holy presence of God. And he starts in the old, uh, in the most holy place, and then the presence moves out into the holy, moves out of the tabernacle. And by the time you get to Ezekiel 11, um, there is a complete movement, a movement out and away from Israel. And it says here, so the cherubim lifted up their wings and the wheels besides them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them, and the glory of the Lord went from the midst of the city. So it left Jerusalem, and it stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. So this is the glory of the Lord all through Ezekiel 8 and all through Ezekiel 11. It's leaving Jerusalem. And that's a sad time, because relatively from that time, the, the voice of prophecy was silent. The voice of prophecy was silent. Until, and all of all of the ancient Jewish time, they were waiting for the voice of prophecy to open its mouth again. And the belief was when the Messiah would come, they viewed the Messiah incorrectly, then the Lord would speak again to his people. And Brother Alex preached about this just a couple weeks ago, what happens in Acts? Christ comes, Christ dies, he leaves, and then the Holy Spirit comes, and it says in Acts 2, that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And we know what happened. They prophesied, and according to the Jewish expectation of that time, scriptures would be opened up again. The voice of prophecy would come again, so it was only natural to anticipate that all those people, specifically those who knew Christ intimately at his time, the apostles, they would be the ones with whom the Holy Spirit would speak. And that's where the idea of the New Testament came. It became acceptable among the, the believing Christians that, you know what, the voice of God is speaking again. What is being spoken and written, we need to write down and keep. So here's where they're filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.4. And that was the birth of the New Testament. There was two beliefs that God would restore his spirit in the people and there would come another time of God's revelation. So if we look at our, Old Test at our New Testaments, um, it's, it's arranged in a certain fashion. We have the synoptic gospels, which are kind of to be viewed together. And you will hear all kinds of critics say, well, why is one gospel a little different than another? Um, but when you look at all the synoptic Gospels, they all generally agree. And you can read Matthew, Mark, and Luke pretty much together. In fact, there was one person in uh, the, during the Dark Ages, what he did was he, he put all of them together into one big book. He tried, to, he tried to make it one big book you could read right through, kind of like our Desire of Ages. Um, and it was, it was a pretty amazing thing, because if you read Luke, you don't get the full picture if you, if you haven't read Mark and, and, uh, and Matthew. Um, and then you have the last, another gospel, <coughs> and that is John, the last gospel, but it's very unique. It is not written like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's different, and it has all kinds of profound things. Just think of Matthew, what do you have in the beginning of Matthew? Just genealogies, right? Exactly. But how does John open? John opens, in, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So very, very different start. Also, uh, the organization of John, it has the most intimate moments of Christ. So you have things like um, the Garden of Gethsemane, or his crucifixion that other, other Gospels may not focus much on. So even though the Gospels might be a little bit different, say things a little bit differently, 
they're all talking about the same Jesus, and um, uh, you know, different ones may focus more on different things. They had a different audience, okay? And then for the rest of the New Testament, you have the Acts, which was written by Luke. So Acts, Acts continues on where, where Luke left off, okay? And it's all about the history of Paul, you know, about how he traveled to all these different places. So it's kind of like a historical narrative. Then you have to follow that, the letters of Paul. I didn't list them all out. But they're instructions and corrections to churches going astray, correct? Then you have James, 1st and 2nd Peter, the letters of John, and then the New Testament concludes with Revelation. Now, if you look in Galatians... What does Paul say here in Galatians 1, 11 through 12? It says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. So this idea of the New Testament was only written by apostles, only written by those who were chosen by Christ. So they had to be chosen by Christ, either know Christ or ha live in very close proximity to the time of Christ. So you have people like James, one of the brothers of Christ. Paul, who was chosen on the road to Damascus. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they were all intimately um, uh, interacting with Christ at that time and the people closely interacting with, that, with Christ. So the New Testament naturally then ends after that generation dies off. Nice little quote here I found from Know How You Got Your Bible, page 27. It says, The New Testament was an outburst of the proclamation of God's word after the coming of Jesus. The apostles who wrote each book did not assume their writings were simply one of the dozen other alternative accounts of the message of God's redemption. The apostles were sent directly by Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and their message held a unique authority over the church. In the same way that the prophets of the, older, of the Old Testament writers wrote of God's word for Israel. So, the sad, the sad reality is we don't have any of these original writings. The exact writing of Matthew, the exact writing of Luke, we don't have it. And they were all lost. And the reality is these were lost in the persecution of the early church. In the early church... There was initially, before Constantine accepted the church or changed the church, there was a strong persecution. So there were only little fragments of manuscripts that were, let's say, you know, from the church here or there, Laodicea, Corinthians, they would pass around. There were no professional scribes. So families would write what little they could, what little chapters they could. So what we have from this time is stuff that's very unprofessional, because there was continuous persecution. But then you go to the time when the church became legitimized by the state. And one thing I will say, for all the faults of the Catholic Church, the early church, it grew one thing, the possibility of writing the text down and preserving it. And it was at the time of Jerome, um, in the AD 300s, there was a pope called uh, Damasus I, and he was dealing with all kinds of heresy in the church. There was ideas of her uh, Arianism, complaints about the Godhead, all kinds of heresy was creeping in from the east, from the west, and the Pope in Rome was getting all kinds of complaints from up north in Europe, and he realized that a way to combat heresy is because the people didn't have the Bible. And if maybe they had the Bible, then we could combat heresy because they can read it for yourself as opposed to me writing every, every bit of the church, writing you know, to different churches all over the place. So he had, um, Pope uh, Damasus had a secretary named Jerome. And in the AD 300s, so this is already 300 plus years after the time of Christ, uh, the Pope instructed his secretary to translate the Gospels into the modern tongue. And at that time, there was, a, there was an old Latin that was already expired for the Latin of that day. So the people, even who could speak Latin, were out of touch with the language that the Bible was already in. So um, 
The Pope didn't have much in mind. He didn't want the Old Testament. He didn't even want the whole New Testament. He only wanted the Gospels. There were some, there were some as it says here, there were other you know, Old Testaments written in Greek and Hebrew, but again, not many people were speaking that anymore. So since the western half of the church spoke Latin, the Pope was in Rome, he decided that it would be best to have a brand new Latin um, or Roman translation for the western church. Uh, especially since the Eastern Church, the Orthodox, it was more Greek. So they had the Greek Bible. So uh, the Vulgate, which is the, the Latin Bible of the time, in 382, the translation begins for that. But what happens? Two years later, the Pope, the Pope died. And when the Pope died, uh, Jerome realized he was free. He was no longer secretary, and he took off. And he actually left Rome, and he went to Israel. He went to Bethlehem. And since he was freed of the constrictions of the church, he decided he would translate the whole Bible, all the way from Genesis, the whole way to Revelation. So he worked many, many years of his life translating the Bible, but the church had not fully authorized him to do that. The church had only authorized him to do the Gospels. Now, while Jerome was in Bethlehem, he met up with Jewish people, and he started to learn the Hebrew language so he could really translate the Old Testament. And it was a very interesting time because the Jews didn't like the Christians. Jerome was a Christian. So those neighbors of him that actually taught him Hebrew were kind of, it was culturally unacceptable. So there was a little bit of persecution there. But eventually, Jerome... As one man, he translates the whole Bible, the Greek Old Testament and the, uh, the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. And it was in that time that Jerome also discovered that the Apocrypha that we talked about last, last time, it was, pro it was not, not truly um, can canonical. So he actually left it out of the Bible. So he presented this to the church, and the church, the Catholic Church, was not very excited of this idea because they only commissioned him to do the, the Gospels. And then he left out the Apocrypha, which they had it all adopted. So the church clung to the old, poor Latin traditions, and they kind of sidelined Jerome's work. But by the 1500s, so you think Jerome, fi Jerome finishes in around 400 um, AD, he dies around 420. By 1500s, the Catholic Church officially recognized Jerome's work hundreds of years later, as being the official work of the church. So 1500s, the Vulgate is recognized as the official work of the Catholic Church. Then one thing happens here, Johannesburg Gutenberg, is anyone familiar with him? He is the reason why everything, everything that we have here, you could even say the printage page on, on my iPad, this is what revolutionized the world, okay? Because up to this point, all scribes, they were writing freehand, every, word, every letter of the Bible. But when Gutenberg came around, he developed the printing press. And one of the first things to ever be printed on the printing press was the Bible. So suddenly, remember how I told you how to, buy, to have a Bible, if a church were to have a Bible, it was like building a church, it cost thousands and thousands of dollars. It's highly expensive. Suddenly something went for something so expensive that a parish or a church couldn't afford a Bible to where maybe somebody in a week's worth of wages could afford a Bible. So the Bible became something that could easily be printed and it could be easily dispersed. Since we're going down the English route, I go to John Wycliffe. So he started, he was born in 1382. He lived till 1395. And remember that, that Vulgate, that Latin Bible, written by Jerome, that initially for hundreds of years the Catholic Church discarded, but finally in the 1500s they decided they would adopt? John Wycliffe decided he, it is wrong. First of all, um, the Vulgate was itself now, in the 1300s, becoming expired. No one could speak the language. 
because the Vulgate, or the Latin language, was changing to our modern French, German, English, Dutch, and so forth in Europe. So John Wycliffe decided, you know what, no one, no one can understand the Bible. You only go to the liturgy and somebody reads it in another language. He wanted the standard English person to have the Bible. So he takes Jerome's Vulgate and he starts to translate it into English. Now, his actions, even though he was in England um, at the time, it went directly against the Catholic Church. Because remember, in the 1500s, what did the Church do? It sanctioned the Latin language only. This is the official Word of God. So they were, they were bent on destroying him. But, as Wycliffe ends, he was preaching, and he had a massive stroke while he was preaching. They carried him out the side door, and then he died. And it took the Catholic Church, I think, close to a decade to finally exhume his remains and burn his body because they didn't have a chance to burn him at the stake. So Jerome, uh, or uh, so John Wycliffe, even in his death, the influence he had that this man had was a was a very very sharp burr, you could say, in the side of the Catholic Church. So much so that they burned him, poured his ashes into the river, and it spread to the seven seas. So the statement is, John Wycliffe always wanted to make the Bible so it could be spread around the world. And his ashes were spread in the, in the same way that he desired his Bible to be spread. So Wycliffe started the movement of the English Bible, the English New Testament. But somebody else who influences us to this very day, William Tyndale, took it to a whole new level. So in 1525, William Tyndale, another English man, he nearly completed the translation of the New Testament. By 1536, most of the Old Testament was translated. So he almost translated the whole Bible, William Tyndale himself. But unfortunately, England, which is at this time uh, a Protestant country, does anyone remember Henry VIII from history class? He got divorced... And it created a huge controversy. And William Tyndale was one of the few men who said, you know what, I don't care what you say. You can't just discard your wife and get another one. So he opposed Henry VIII. And Henry VIII, as well as the Catholic Church who hated him, um, they had him arrested in Spain. And he was burned at the stake there in 1536. But the famous words of William Tyndale leave, uh, live till today. It says, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than he, which is the Pope, dust. So famous words of William Tyndale. Now I'm going to come to the King James Bible. I believe you have Henry VIII. Maybe Mary, Queen of Scots, my wife knows all these English things. You have the Elizabeth, then you have James I. And James I came to power in England, and you had a strong Anglican movement, and you had a strong Puritan movement. And James decided, they were both kind of enemies, the Puritans and the Anglicans, he decided that a good way to make these two groups, religious groups in his country, get along was for them to update the Bible update the Bible into their modern-day language. So what he did is he said, you know what, I want you to focus on the writings of the Bishop's Bible, which was a Bible older than the King James Version. And they made a group of people from both the Puritans and the Anglicans. They came together for a common accord of translating or uh, taking, updating the English Bible of the time. Now the King James Bible that you have today the first version was in 1611, and um, it's not a translation. They didn't go back to the Hebrew text. They didn't go back to the Greek text. What they did is they took different Bibles, old Bibles, and they put them together, and as a group, they tried to decide which was the best rendering of certain verses. They used the Bishop's Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Great Bible, the Douay Rhymes Bible, and the vast majority of the King James Bible comes from guess who? William Tyndale. So the vast majority of our Bibles we have today, even though William Tyndale could not finish it, it is incorporated into the King James, into the King James Version. 
A very interesting thing about the King James Committee is when the 1611 Bible was made, it was more difficult to read than the William Tyndale Bible. They made it more complicated because they felt that if it was more formal, then it would be more elevated. It would sound more godlike. So they actually complicated the writing of the Bible more than, let's say, um, William Tyndale did at the time. So the King James Bible, it was made in England, sanctioned by the government. And since it was sanctioned by the government, it was copyrighted. So you could only get a Bible that was made by the government printing press. You couldn't copy your own Bible. You'd get in trouble for copyright infringement and go to jail. But how did the King James Version become so, so powerful like it is today in our country? You had the development of the New World. And with the colonies, all kinds of people came who were persecuted. The Puritans, people from Europe. So you had all kinds of cultures coming and mixing in the United States, or the, the, the English colonies of the time. And what I found most amazing about the King James Bible is that the popularity of the King James Bible followed the strength of the United States. So you had a movement of people. King James Bibles, Puritans, all these people persecuted to the colonies. And then you had the American Revolution. And what's really, really amazing, it says in 1777, only a matter of months after the Declaration of Independence, the newly established Congress debated whether to fund the printing of the King James Version. And this is not a topic you would think a brand new nation would think is important to discuss, right? But... The point is that the King James Version endured as an American symbol of overcoming British tyranny. So what they said is, we don't care. We don't care about your copyright laws. We're a new nation now. We're going to print the Bible whether you like it or not. You can't put any infringement on us. So as a revolution, not only was it again, you know, in tea and taxes, they even had a revolution in the religious circle where they printed the King James Bible freely. So while there is a copyright, the English church couldn't control it. And as, as America grew, as the Protestant um, churches grew, so did the King James Version Bible grow. And it was the number one Bible sold in the world for decades, for maybe well over 100 years. So that's a brief, brief history of to our modern day language, or the King James Bible. There are a few manuscripts behind our Bibles. Um, just kind of like I went into the Old Testament, what are the manuscripts behind the Old Testament? This is what's in our Bibles here today, and hopefully my scribble is not too small. But you have Jerome starting here in 382, and he wrote the Latin Bible. And remember the Latin by William Tyndale, it was being converted to English. And that Latin Bible was based off of um, a... Uh, a Greek test called, text called the Textus Receptus. And that Textus, Textus Receptus has a lot of ties also from the, uh, from the Orthodox Church, from the Eastern Church. Now the Textus Receptus was the most common Greek text of the New, New Testament because it was the first one printed on the Gutenberg Press. Now... People thought, you know, so that was discovered or made around 1516, the Receptus. But now, recently, as early as 1844, a whole new group of texts have been found that are actually very, very much older than the Receptus. They came, there's the Vaticanus. This is all where they're stored. So the Vatican stored the one in green. And then you have the Alexandrinus, which was found in Alexandria. And these were built or written or copied in the 400s. So very, very close in comparison to the time of Christ, about 400 years after. Um, so the Ale Alexandrinus, it was in Alexandria. Then it was shipped to Constantinople. And then eventually it was sent to England in the 17th century, and they found it in some museum somewhere. And what that led is... I'll, I'll talk about this last one here, the Sinaiticus. It was found in a monastery near what they thought was Mount Sinai. What that led is, 
since most of the old Bibles were written, Textus Receptus, King James Version, all these new texts came out and they said, you know what? Which is the right one? Which is the right manuscript? And if you look at the Bibles that we read today in English, you have the Byzantine text or the Receptus, and that's the King James Bible, the New King James Version. You have some Western texts, which are more Catholic Bibles, like the Dewey Rames Version. And then you have the Alexandrian Version, which was the Sinaiticus, or you have the, uh, the, the other ones. And that's the New International, the New Living, King, uh, English Standard, the New English Translation. So that's where you get the different versions. They have different base texts, different traditions. So these tend to all be the newer Bibles, and this, is, this tends to be the King James Version here. Wow. So many people who critique our Bibles, they say, why are there so many manuscripts? Why are there so many translations? And I want to bring up one thing on scribal errors because I think it's important. I, I learned a lot from, from reading about this. I think it's important that we kind of understand how the Bible came to us. I challenge everybody to go home this week and to, let's say, write two or three chapters from their Bible. Free write it with their hand. And then read it and see, no matter how careful you were, did you miss commas? Did you miss periods? Did you misspell? When you're copying the Bible down, did you skip a line or two and make an error? That's very, very common. And if you look here at the translators, this is the Codus Sinaiticus. I want you to look at a couple of things. You can actually look at these Bibles online, written, pictures taken as they were found. The Old Greek had no spaces. It was all just continuous words. There was no space between a word. So if you did that today, you could easily misread a sentence. And then the scribe would make an error, and here he's sneaking in a K or an R, and here he has a whole word he snuck in, or they would put something in there. Now the next scribe comes, and he's copying this one, and he sees this, and he's like, oh, this needs to go in here, or it needs to go in here, and he could make an error. I, I, I agree, but sometimes this is how it was back then. They made errors, and they tried the best they could to correct it. So what happens is you would have these scribal errors just by being a normal human being, and different texts would get copied, and similar errors would propagate. Let's say this guy accidentally put this word back in here, or he put it in there, and you would have different families that would form. So that's where you get this whole idea of the Vaticanus. These ones all look similar because different errors propagated. These ones all look similar because different error, errors approximated. And this one all looked similar. So what you have is people will criticize our, our, our Bible and say, you know what, there's close to 50,000 errors where our Bibles disagree. And what do we say if, you, if we hear that? Is that... Is that something that should shake, uh, shake our faith? There are people who accuse you of that, yeah. or accuse the Bible of that. But I think if, if, if in any way people are concerned of this, I have a few sources at the end where you can read into it. Um, there should be no concern among Christians when someone comes up and say, there are errors in the Bible, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because even though there might be a little insertion here, or they may have put something wrong, they were human, and in the end, when you put all these manuscripts together, they all say pretty much the same thing. And here's, here's an example of variations among texts, okay? Of course, they're all written in English. First sentence here I'll read, we have a great majority of textual differences between manuscripts that are matters of small detail and have no real, real theological significance. Look at Mark 8.26. These are all variations from Mark 8.26. Don't even go into the village, next variation. Don't tell it to anyone in the village, next variation. Don't even go into the village nor tell it to anyone in the village, next variation. Go into your house and don't tell it to anyone in the village. Go into your house, um, uh, go into your house and if you go into the village, don't tell anyone, not even in the village. You see what I mean? The idea is all the same. There's no theological difference. 
the Bible verse still says the same thing. So when you have different manuscripts that may have all these different variations, by and large, the sentence, the verse, the chapter, all says the same theology. So people can easily be confused or easily be concerned when someone comes up to them, a critic, and says, how, how come you trust the Bible when every version, you can even say in English, how they don't say the exact same letter, how they don't say the exact same word. And I think as, as Americans or English speakers only, someone who speaks one language, we have this problem. If you talk to our Russian speakers, they realize that it's very hard to take one language and make it sound exactly the same in the other language. So it was hard for a translator to perfectly take one language and bring it into our modern day language without slight variations in how they would translate a word here and there. Here's another example, John 5, 17. But he answered them. Another text may say, but Jesus answered them. But it's implied that they're talking of Christ. Acts 2, 24, the pangs of death Another translator might say the pangs of Hades. Uh, Philippians, to speak the word, or the other option would be to speak the word of God. So many times you can get hooked up on things like this, and your faith can be shaken, but in reality that should be no, no concern for our faith at all. In further looking at all these variations, as I mentioned, A, most of the variations are not significant theologically, B, variations in the manuscripts recognized to be valid do not consistently weaken or pervert a doctrine. So let's say up here, let's say in this last one, oh, they left Jesus out. They're against Christ. You can pick that, but in the next chapter, this translation will say, oh, Christ, and then the other one will leave Christ out. So there's nothing really there that is meant maliciously. It was just maybe a word was dropped. Another thing, if you have people who say, they have a pet text and they say, well, you know, I follow the Receptus, or I follow the Sinaiticus, you could accuse either text of making the same kind of improper variant in a different location. So it's very, very uh, wrong, I would say, to get stuck or all wrapped up in these textual criticisms like so many people do, especially when they can't even read the text themselves from the very beginning. So here's another question, which version is the best? So which version is the best version? And to that, I would say the version that you read is the best. I would rather somebody read the Bible and read it every day in whatever version they wanted. But to force somebody to read one version or another, like so many times we do, I think it's, it can be a, a foolish thing. And here's an example of more formal-based and more meaning-based Generally, you have things like the King James, they're more formal based, they, re they translate word for word. The New Living Bible translations, it may be more meaning based. The text may say this is what they meant to say rather than using it a word for word. So I think it's usually better to be on a formal side or a literal equivalent. But in the end, the version that somebody is willing to read every day, that's the right version. So C.S. Lewis uh, in a letter he wrote to uh, Lee Turner in 1958, he says, As for translation, even if one doesn't know Greek, we have now so many different translations that by using them and comparing them, we can usually see what is happening. So when you go and you open a new international version and you read a text and it means something a little bit better than if you read it in the King James Version or New Living, there can be a benefit because you can see, hmm, this is how texts differed. And in the end, the theolo theology is still the same. So I have one last word, because the New International Version can be very, very, um, there can be a lot of current controversy around it. And there's an interesting story about the New Inter International Version. So there was a Christian businessman in the 1950s. And his name, he, he, or he was uh, Evangelicus, Evangelic, Evangelist, yes, Howard Long. So what he did is he was traveling on a business trip, and he met a man in a hotel lobby who was a businessman. Now Howard Long, he's like, I'm going to witness to this man in the hotel lobby.
So he pulled out his King James Bible. He started flipping through the Bible, reading in Bible verses. And this businessman's face got redder and redder. And finally, the businessman broke out laughing. And he's like, what in the world are you reading me? I can't understand a single word you're saying. This is foolishness. And the businessman stormed out. And Howard Long thought about this a long time. And he realized that the English Bible... The, English, uh, the King James Bible, not every American could read adequately. And when he realized that, he said, you know what? We need to make a Bible that the average standard American on the street can read. And that began the work of close to 30 years, 23 years, of building the New International Version Bible. So while, while me growing up, I grew up on the King James Bible. I feel like I'm pretty solid in that. There's still value to other translations. And when you look at William Tyndale, what did he want to happen? He wanted the plowboy to be able to understand the Bible. So don't we today want our plowboys to understand the Bible? If you look at um, the 1611 King James Version preamble, it says, We desire that the scripture may speak like itself, as in the language of Canaan, that it may be understood even of the very vulgar, which meant the plowboy of that time. That was the old King James Version. So the King James was built for the people of that time that even, you know what? The guy on the street could understand it. Today, as we look today, perhaps much of society cannot understand it. So I will never be somebody who points at someone and says, you know what? You have to learn the King James only or else you're going to hell. I think that's probably... A, a tough statement to say because all along, God's Bible was written in the language of the people. In, in 1896, a British archaeologist found a trash, a trash heap in the Middle East. They grabbed this treasure trove of trash and they started to analyze it. And it was all written in Greek from the time of when the scriptures were first written. And you know what they noticed? They noticed that they had just discovered the equivalent of standard Greek, street Greek, you could say, that was spoken during the time of Christ. And when they took that street Greek, which was like um, uh, documents, marriage documents, contracts, receipts, lease applications, when they took that Greek and they compared it to the Greek of the Old Testament, the Greek was exactly the same. And that means that the Old Testament was not written in an elevated Greek. It was written for the Greek of the people who could understand it. For the businessman on the street, he could understand the Old Testament in the same language that he was used to. He didn't have to memorize something or understand something from two, three hundred years prior. That Greek is called Koine Greek, or it meant commoner's Greek. So um, many times, I remember when I was traveling for medical school, I went actually to the East Coast, and I would go to different Adventist churches, I had a New American Standard Bible, and it was a little Bible, a travel Bible, and I went to this Adventist church, and someone confronted me, and he said, you know what, you're, you're reading the devil's Bible. You're reading the devil's Bible, King James only, the rest are corrupted. You know, I think for people to say that is a, is a tough thing, because as we look, as we look back here, in the preservation of God's Bible, many, many different scripts Many, many different versions. All so that, you know what? So the common person, the common person can read that Bible and understand it. So I'll never be one to criticize somebody for the type of, uh, type of Bible they're reading. Here in conclusion, it is reassuring at the end to find that the general result of all these discoveries and all this study is to strengthen the proof of our authentic authenticity of the scriptures and of our conviction that we have in our hands, in the substantial integrity, the veritable word of God. 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not of the old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And lastly, Romans 15, 4, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures, the encouragement they 
and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So my wish and prayer for us all, when we hear different things, when someone may confront you on the type of version you have, I would say the right version for all of us is the one we choose to read, and read every day. And if you are interested to learn a little bit more about this, these are two books I've read. One is How We Got Our Bible, and it goes through the whole history of the Old and New Testament. And if you're into, like, getting into the nitty-gritty textual stuff, this one, the text of the New Testament, and they, they'll go in at nauseum at everything you can learn. And hopefully, um, hopefully you can have a strengthening of your faith in understanding how God has preserved your word for us. And then, of course,